Hello and welcome back to our um, summer bioinformatics bootcamp, machine learning for um, biomedical applications in Python. My name is Henry and today we're going to be doing a review week of the first part of our workshop, which is all about basic Python and basic data science in Python. So uh, with that being said, if you feel very comfortable with your skills up to this point, feel free to skip this part because this is really for just a refresher and a review of the homeworks that we've done so far, as well as the TV project, which Simon introduced in the last lecture. So uh, with all that being said, let's jump in here and get the code for today. So you're gonna go to our website, that's bigbioinformatics.org. Go here to the workshop for today or sorry, the workshop for the uh, for the summer. Um, go here to the GitHub repository link. Come over here to where it says code. Download that zip file. You can see it got downloaded here. Open that up. Extract it. If you're on Mac, it'll be something similar to this, but this is how it should look on Windows. And now I've got all the code and the data. So what I'm gonna do is open up Jupyter Notebook, which I can do from right here. Um, again, this might be slightly different on your file system or your computer, but this is how it will probably look for most of you Windows users. Okay, um, so I'm gonna to go to where I downloaded the code, which is right here on my computer. It might be different on yours. I'm gonna go ahead and open up first the module two challenge problems. Now in the uh, previous video, we solved the first one, two, three, four, five, six of these. So I'm not gonna go back through them. You can go back to that previous video and watch again if you'd like to see the solutions. Um, today, I'm gonna to briefly go through the last four problems, which all involve using NumPy. So for problem number seven, um, the problem statement was using list comprehension and NumPy make a list with 25 random integers between zero and a thousand. So uh, was anyone able to complete this? Anyone have their answer for this? Feel free to put it in the chat if you do. Um, and I'll, I'll give just a, a few seconds for this and then I'll go through it myself. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start going through it. Um, feel free to, okay, okay, all right, so, okay. All right, so we've got some answers now. This is great. Okay, very good, very good. Um, okay. Okay, so lots, actually three, three different answers. Um, very good. So uh, all of these are to varying degrees correct, depending on, um, how you viewed the problem. So let, let's actually go through this now. So um, the first thing that you needed to do if you hadn't already was to import NumPy. So the way that we typically do this in just typical data science nomenclature is this import NumPy as NP. That's how you'll most often see it done. Okay, so we import NumPy. Uh, now it says to make a list comprehension here. So if you recall, a list comprehension is going to involve a set of double square brackets, and it's going to typically involve some sort of for something in something. Now, the part that follows the in is going to be some sort of iterable. In this case, we said we wanted to make a list with 25 random integers. So probably the easiest way for us to do this is just to say for i in range 25. It's a really easy way to make a um, iterable that's got 25 elements, okay? So for i in range 25, what are we gonna do? Well, we want to find 25 random integers between zero and a thousand. So let's actually do that with NumPy. So to get a random integer, uh, and all of you got this part, so um, you go in the random uh, sub module here, and you get the rand int 
function. Now rand int takes two, well, it takes several arguments, but it takes two that we really care about here, which are, oh, I guess it's not bringing up the, uh, the help page for me. Well, low and high. So low will be zero, high will be 1,000. Because what this is gonna do is it's gonna pick a random integer between these numbers. So what we're basically saying here is for i in range 25, so 25 times, we're gonna pick this random number. So this was one way to do it. Um, this is if you're using a list comprehension. Okay, um, so probably a slightly uh, better way to do it would have been to not use a list comprehension, although that would have been outside the actual problem statement. Um, but for example, I think Catherine, the way that you did it would have also worked. Um, so this actually returns an array, but you could have made it a list just like Jesse did. So if you really wanted it to be a list. Okay. Um, but we did say between zero and a thousand. We didn't actually specify whether the thousand was inclusive or exclusive. So whether or not you said 1001 or 1000 here, you were technically correct either way. Okay. Was there any questions on this one? Okay, so let's move on to the next one. If you've got questions at any point, feel free to put them in the chat. All right, so using the list from number seven, create a 2D array with five rows and five columns. So let's go ahead and actually save this list now. We'll put it in a uh, put it in a variable. My LST. Okay. So now we've got my LST. Okay. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to take this list and make a two D array with five rows and five columns. Uh, so. Anyone want to tell me how you go about doing that? What was their code that they used for this one? Okay, all right, very good. Okay, any other any other answers for this one? All right, so very good. What you would do, and this is exactly what, what Jesse said, what you would do is basically np.array, and you give the argument my list or whatever you called your list. And then, so this converts it to an array, now arrays can be reshaped. So you just use the reshape method on it. Reshape, then five, five, five rows, five columns. And there you go, you've now got your 2D matrix. Okay. Um, okay, so now do you have a question? Okay. Um, anyways, so now with the array from number eight, find the Pearson correlation between the standard deviation of the rows and the mean of the rows. Okay, this was, uh, the, the difficulty jump was pretty steep on this question, um, particularly if you were still confused about how the axis argument works. So um, what answers did people have for this one? Did anyone get this one? Okay. Okay, any, any other answers for this one? Okay, okay, great, great. So it looks like it looks like uh, people are getting this one, which is great. 
All right. Okay, awesome, awesome. So it looks like it looks like everyone's getting this concept. Then this is perfect. All right, so um, we're going to save this in some sort of variable. So I'll just call this my array. Um, okay. All right. And we said to uh, find the Pearson correlation of the standard deviation of the rows and the mean of the rows. So let's find the standard deviation of the rows first. Um, so we'll say here, my array dot STD. And then now, just so you can see why this is necessary, if we don't supply any other arguments, you see, we just get one value, and that's because it finds a standard deviation of the entire 2D array. It is not considering the rows, and it's not considering the columns. But what we want to find is the standard deviation of the rows. So to do that, we use the axis argument here. So um, it's not giving me any suggestions, but yeah. Usually when you hit tab in Jupyter Notebook, it'll start giving you suggestions for the argument name if you've already typed part of it. It's not doing that right now for me, though. Um, so we say axis is equal to one here, and that signifies that we want to find the standard deviation of the rows because, and just to show why this is true here, we'll use another example, but that's because the uh, one is the columns. And just to again show why that's the case, because I, I want to drive home this point, um, let's say that we came back all the way to here. Um, and instead of doing it like this, we actually put the list in here. And I'm going to use Dan's trick. So we're going to get a list comprehension that's got two times four elements. So that would be eight elements, which means we can reshape it as two by four. Okay. So if we did that, you can see now we have two rows, four columns. Okay, now if we said the uh, STD of the rows, it's got two elements, right? Axis one, if the axis was zero, it would have four elements. And that's because the way this works is you go outermost dimension, to the innermost dimension. The outermost dimension was the rows. The innermost dimension was the columns. The axis tells you what dimension you're going to collapse, okay? In this case, we're gonna collapse the rows, and that means we're actually getting the standard deviation of the columns. Collapse the rows, collapse the rows, collapse the rows, collapse the rows. If we wanted to collapse the columns and get the standard deviation of them, we would be collapsing across the rows, collapsing those columns down into one value, which is the standard deviation. That's why we get two values here. So just to make this clear how this is working, hopefully that is starting to feel intuitive. You all got that right, so I suspect it is, or you are getting good at looking things up. Either is totally valid. Okay. I'm gonna get the mean of the rows now. Okay, and then we're going to print the Pearson cor correlation coefficient. Okay, so that's just NP dot core coef. And then we give the uh, rows, or sorry, STD rows and mean rows. And there you go. All right. Any questions on this? I know the access thing is, is very confusing, uh, but it, it's helpful to just remember when you supply the axis, you are saying, I want to collapse that dimension. And I want to collapse that dimension to um, get the 
standard deviation or the mean or whatever it is. But that means that's a dimension that's going to disappear. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead on to the next one now. Okay. Finally, and this one was quite difficult, uh, generate two random numbers, A, B, between negative 10 and 10, make an array containing all the points between A and B in increments of 0 0.1, write a function which takes this array, A and B, and returns an array containing... Uh, all the points whose distances from the midpoint of A and B is less than one. It was a mouthful. So anyone had an answer to this? Okay. Okay, okay. Nice. There was there were many many uh, good ways to solve this actually. So any any other uh, any other ways that people went about solving this one? Okay. So. Um, Lee Ju, that's a that's a great answer. Um, I'll show you now how I did it. And, and if anyone else has a different answer, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and because this will take me a second. Okay. So the first part of this is going to be pretty much the same no matter what, which is that random integer generator from NumPy. Okay. So let's say that we have a is np dot random dot rand int um, low being negative 10 and high being 10. Okay, um, so this is how you could get A and you could get B this way as well. Okay, so then we'll, we'll um, display believe this is the correct way of doing it. Display A and display B. All right, so in this case, I got um, nine, one, nine, so you can see it's, it's random every time. All right, so that was the first part. Generate two numbers that are randomly generated between negative 10 and 10. All right, now we have to make an array containing all the points between A and B in increments of 0 0.1. Um, there were actually many ways to do this, um, and I think there's probably some people came up with a few of them. Um, so, um, let's see here. I can't remember exactly how I did it. Let me take a look at my my notebook. Actually, um, so. There was actually a pure NumPy solution to this. I just remember what it was. Okay, so NP arrange. Uh, so let's say that A is less than B. Okay, so in this case, oh, nice. Um, so in this case, uh, A is less than B. So we could say NP arrange A, B.1. And you can see we've now got all the numbers between A and B in increments of 0.1. And that is because a range takes the arguments start, stop, step. Okay. But what if, I'm just going to see if I can get this here. Um, okay. What if A was not less than B? This no longer works. So you can see here. So there was a couple of ways you could do this. Um, if you wanted to use this pure NumPy solution. Um, and this is one that, you know, I think, kind of works in the context of what you've learned so far. So I could say if A is greater than B, um, I could say B A one, U if B is greater than A. Uh, 
a b and so this will this will always produce as long as they're not equal to each other this will always produce r and g being between oh right i i forgot there's also for some reason there's kind of a weird bug in here where it does this massive float number but yeah um if you round it which you can do to one decimal points it it just displays it as the normal one decimal point float i'm not entirely sure why numpy does that but anyways this will pretty much always work as long as um uh, as long as A and B are not equal, you can make an edge case for that and actually deal with that here if you want to, like generate them again if they happen to be equal. But in this case, they're not equal, and so I'm not going to bother with that for right now. So the next point was to make a function that takes this array, A and B, and returns an array containing all the points whose distances from the midpoint of A and B was less than one. It's kind of a you know mouthful there, but we'll start with the first part of that, make a function. And you can call this whatever, I'll just call this my function. Um, and we could say here it takes the arguments um, array, so my array, A and B. Um, but this could be whatever you want. In this case, I called this RNG, so I'll just call it that here too. Um, so we've now got a function and it returns an array containing all the points whose distances from the midpoint of A and B is less than one. So let's find the midpoint. So uh, midpoint of A and B, um, which would just be A plus B divided by two. So that one was pretty easy. Um, all right. Uh, containing all the points whose distances from this point are less than one. So. What we could do essentially here is we could say, um, we can make a Boolean array where uh, we say um, absolute value of RNG minus midpoint is less than one. So if we do this, so let's, let's actually test this for a second so you can see what this is gonna do. So this midpoint is four in this case. So if we look at this absolute value is less than one, we can see it's basically just finding all of the values of the array where the distance between that value and the midpoint was actually less than one. And that's where you're seeing these trues here. And if we recall, we can actually use a Boolean array to subset a numerical array. And so what we're gonna just do is return RNG by my Boolean. And just to show you what that will do here, you can see now it's got RNG, but it is all the values where the distance is less than one. Okay, so just to show that this function actually would work. And so now let's go ahead and test the function. My function T, A, and B, it gives us the same thing. Okay, um, so uh very good work to everyone who attempted these problems they were extremely difficult problems um especially this last one this one was very hard uh, this one even took me a minute to to figure out okay so um any questions on this any any issues people had with this homework Okay, um, well, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and um, hand over the lecture to Simon now, who's gonna go through the module three and the TV project. 
All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. There we go. And let me just open all the chat windows so that I can see if someone has a question. Cool. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm just going to go through somewhat quickly the TV project notebook that you guys could use as sort of a, a guide to the homework. Um, just to kind of showcase what you can do with like a very simple data analysis um, with Pandas. So what data science with Pandas looks like, um, because last time in the lecture, we kind of just did sort of a really dry glossary type showcasing of different methods. And now we're, we're actually going to use them on a real data set and see how we can extract information from data using this. So if you've read this, you'll know that we're dealing with three data sets, uh, one that has game information on each Super Bowl up to like, I think 2018 or something. Um, the other data set has TV ratings information on the same Super Bowls. And the last data set has information on the halftime shows for each of those Super Bowls. And we're going to extract information from all of them and combine them in interesting ways to see if we can learn something about Super Bowls. All right. So these are the installs for all the um, packages we're going to use in this notebook. I already have all of them, so I'm not going to run this lock. But if you don't, do it now. All right. So the first thing they do is just loading all three data sets. And they're just going to look at the head of each. And the head will just display the first five rows of each data set. So let's do that. That's a really important first step to do whenever you do data analysis. Just have a look at your data. So the first thing you should do is just look. What, what's it look like? So the first one here is the Super Bowl. So this is the game data. So we see the date, what Super Bowl number it is, where was it, uh, how many people were there, who won, by how many points, and so forth. Various information about the quarterbacks and the, uh, the coaches, all of that. The next one is the TV data set. So here we see, again, we see what number Super Bowl was it. And then we see what network was it broadcast on, how many viewers were there. Um, and what were the different um, ratings and shares of various demographics that that Super Bowl captured? And then lastly, oh yeah, and how much it is how much did a halftime ad cost? And then lastly, uh, we have the halftime shows. So here we just see who played, how many songs did they sing, and again, what number Super Bowl was this? <laughs> Sorry, was there a question? Um, yeah, you're you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions or type in chat. OK. So next, um, we have a couple of missing values here. Um, see, for example, here, the second quarterback for, uh, for the Eagles here is an NA. In fact, the second quarterback for a lot of teams is an NA. That makes sense, because usually you don't have to use your backup quarterback in the Super Bowl unless something real drastic happens. Um, so let's, that gives us an idea that there might be, there might be some missing values. So let's just have a look at, um, at the info method, which just gives us some information on the data set. So here we have first the TV and then the halftime musicians, the information. And so we can see that there's 53 non-null objects for the Super Bowl column, which makes sense because there are 53 Super Bowls. And really we should know what number Super Bowl each Super Bowl was. Um, so there's, there's nothing missing here. However, if you look at, for example, the rating for the 18 to 49 demographic, um, there's only 15 non-null values. And that's probably because that data is not available for, for some of the older Super Bowls, or maybe it was too much of a pain to get to, and so they didn't do it. Um, same for the number of songs. There's not, we don't have that for each musician that played. So let's just keep that in mind. All right. So next, they're doing some plotting. So um, they're going to look at uh, the combined points for each Super Bowl, uh, and they're just going to do a histogram. And they're going to look at what that distribution, uh, what kind of shape that distribution has. So we can see this is the histogram. On the y-axis, we have the number of Super Bowls that are in a certain in a given bin. And then on the x, x-axis, we have bins of uh, how many combined points there were. Um, so we can see that 
there's a, some of a, something of a concentration among like 40 to 50 points um, in a game. But there were some really high scoring games and some pretty low scoring games. And then lastly, they just look at, um, they filter the data here and they look at how many, uh, what were the Super Bowls that had more than 70 combined points and less than 25. And they see that there were a few there. Um, so already starting to sort of actually extract information. So this would be answering the question, what were some of the highest and lowest scoring Super Bowls in history? And uh, where did they where did they fall? Were they outliers or were they just at the end of sort of a bell curve distribution? All right. Next, we're going to look at a histogram of the point difference. So uh, were there a lot of just games where one team just dominated over the other? And again, we're going to do a histogram. And unsurprisingly, usually it's two of the best teams in the league that make it to the Super Bowl. The majority of Super Bowls didn't have a massive point difference. They were like between zero and 10 points. But there were, a couple, there were uh, actually one game right here that had over 40 points difference. So that is rough. And again, we, uh, we filter this to see um, what were the games that were closest. So where was the point difference exactly one? Who won their Super Bowl by one? And who won their Super Bowl by more than 35 points? We see there was um, just the one Super Bowl, Super Bowl 25, where uh, the Giants beat the Bills by one point. And there were actually uh, one, two, three, four Super Bowls where there were um, 35 or more points difference. That 45 point difference right here was Super Bowl 24, where the 49ers beat who? The Broncos, rough. OK, so now let's start combining this game data with another data set that we have that is the, um, the TV ratings, right? So we want to know if people are watching the Super Bowl and it's just an absolute, it's just an absolute carnage. One team is just clearly going to win. Do people turn off the TV? So let's have a look. So first, what we want to do is combine the two data sets, right? So what we do here is we do a merge. So here they use the merge function where they use um, the, uh, the TV data set for every Super Bowl, and they combine it with the Super Bowls data set. And they, the on argument, what column do they use to match, what variable do they use to match the row, is the Super Bowls variable, which makes sense, because we want to match the game data from Super Bowl one with the TV data from Super Bowl one, and so on and so forth. And then they're going to do this uh, regression plot, where they plot the um, the point difference in each game against the uh, household share that um, that this game got in ratings. So let's have a look at what that looks like. All right. So we can see that there is a downward trend. Um, so this suggests that there may be sort of a mechanism where people bail on the game if it's just uh, if it's just incredible. Um, but let's bear in mind that this is a pretty weak correlation, and you can see that the variability is pretty high. So that would suggest that, well, there might be a relationship between people turning off when it's blowout. There are probably other factors that contribute more to, uh, to whether or not people are going to tune into a Super Bowl. All right. So let's have a look at viewership in the ad industry. So what we do here. Um, we uh, check if Super Bowl ads have always been as incredibly expensive as they are now, and whether or not the development of the price of, an, of a halftime ad corresponds to, uh, to ratings. So we're going to do actually a subplot where we have three different, um, three different graphs, and we look at the average number of US viewers, the household ratings, and the ad cost for each Super Bowl. And we can see that the ad cost has started to really go up around Super Bowl 30 or so. Um, but that doesn't really correspond very much to the, uh, to the household rating, and not, not exactly to the average number of viewers either. There doesn't seem to be any sort of inflection point. Um, to, to either of these top two curves. Whereas the ad cost, there's definitely, they've been pretty, 
pretty low, but then they've, they've increased a lot since like Super Bowl 30. All right, so maybe uh, another hypothesis, maybe the ad cost scales with the quality of super of uh, halftime shows. Maybe that's what the, that's what's the matter. So let's have a look at all the halftime musicians that played before Super Bowl 27. So it's, if we say the inflection points kind of here, where ads start to get really expensive, let's see who played who played the halftime shows before then. So turns out number 27 was Michael Jackson. Apparently, when they started, when they had Michael Jackson at their Super Bowl, after that, the ad costs went up by a lot. Well, let's look. Let's look at before then. We have like marching bands, marching bands, various marching bands. Don't they, and apparently those weren't exactly uh, massive draws for audiences, and so maybe that's why uh, when they had a lot of marching bands, ads were kind of cheap. But once they started booking superstars for their halftime shows, maybe that's why after that, the ad cost just exploded. Now, it's important to realize here that these are all correlations, right? We haven't tested any hypotheses. And this will become really important for uh, when we do machine learning later on. But also, if you end up being a data scientist and you present graphs and, and figures like this to your bosses, well, you haven't actually tested anything, right? You're just giving them like, hints. You're extracting sort of correlations and relationships from your data sets. And then the rest is conjecture. The rest is stuff that will give you the basis to test the hypothesis. But it's not, you, you haven't done any testing on this yet. All right. Now, lastly, let's have a look at who has done the most halftime show appearances. So here, we're going to first use the group by method that I introduced last time. I'm going to group it by musician. And then we're just going to do a count. And we're going to reset the index. And then afterwards, we're going to sort the values and see who, um, who had the most. So apparently, the Grambling State University Tiger Marching Band was at the Super Bowl a whopping six times, which is odd. <laughs> they, must have, uh, they must have been in those early Super Bowls when uh, ads didn't cost a half million dollars yet. All right. And then. Lastly, uh, yes, lastly, we're going to figure out who performed the most songs. So first, we're going to filter out um, all the marching bands. Because the marching bands, they don't play like distinct songs. And even if they do, they often play a lot of them. But what we're interested in is like musicians who have distinct songs. Um, and we want to know how many different songs they play. So they're going to filter it by using this tilde, which means everything that's not what comes after. So it's kind of like the not operator. And so this here, these methods, they, um, they look if the string in a variable contains a certain substring. So anything that contains marching gets kicked out. Anything that contains spirit, which is a very common name for marching bands, also gets kicked out. And then we look at the max value of, uh, of number of songs. And we plot a histogram for that. And then we also sort our no marching bands data set by the number of songs and display it. So it looks like the distribution is that the vast majority of people that played less than four songs, fewer than four songs. But there were a few that played, that played quite a bit more. In fact, Justin Timberlake here at Super Bowl 52 played uh, 11 songs. Um, but yes. So we can get some information on what the distribution is for how many songs um, halftime musicians tend to play. And that's about it. This last one really just uh, let you predict the winner of the 20, uh, 2019 Super Bowl, which uh, shouldn't have been a big problem since uh, 2021. So that's kind of just a, a really brief overview of what it looks like when you just do a really simple sort of straightforward analysis where you answer a few fairly basic questions given uh, three disparate data sets that you have to combine to answer your questions. So at this point, are there any questions about anything they did here or how they did it before we move on to the homework and it becomes a bit more interactive? I just wanted to kind of showcase what this can look like.
Okay. Cool. All right, so let's start on the homework. So here we're looking at the Gapminder data set, which is um, a data set on demographic and economic data across the years on various countries. And then for the questions that required you to run a stats test, we're just looking at a, a quick uh, sort of flow chart here for you to determine what test to use. So um, if you could post in chat what you did for the first question here, that's a sort of just the intro where we just load the data sets and just inspect it a little bit. So let's see what you guys did for that. Or if you have questions about it, you can ask those. Not all at once. Oh. All right. So the first one, yep, loading the data into a data frame. Let's start by doing that. Um, so Gapminder equals, well, first, actually, let's import canvas. All right. And then next thing Catherine did was look at the first five rows. So let's do that. All right. Okay. And you're filtering stuff already. I'll, I'll save the filtering stuff for the next question. All right. So let's have a look here at our data. Um, so we can see that the first five rows all concern uh, Afghanistan over five separate years. And then they have various demographic and economic values here, such as their population, what country they're on, the GDP per capita, uh, CO2 emissions, metric tons per capita, and so on and so forth. We can see the agricultural value added there. We don't have information for Afghanistan for those years. And we have this unnamed column that just seems to be a, a replicate of the of the row indices. You don't have to do this, but I went ahead and uh, just cleaned my data by dropping this column altogether. And so I drop this, and then it's important to say in place equals true, because um, this way the Gapminder object gets modified directly. And then lastly, there's an access argument here too. But you can actually just type it out in Canvas because Canvas is nice. Oh, or maybe not. Oh, typo. Okay. Uh, so if we now display Gapminder head again, you'll see that everything's the same except this uh, this point, this column is gone now. All right. So the next question said to filter the data to only include rows where the year is 1962, and then make a scatter plot comparing CO2 emissions and the GDP per capita. So if someone wants to um, post their code for that. Okay. Catherine did some, uh, did some column renaming and some filtering already in the first question. That is totally fine to do. I'm just gonna I'm gonna save that for here.
Anybody? Did you guys have trouble with the homework? Because that's totally fine too. Uh, if you want me to go over it and explain it step by step, um, because you guys struggle with it, that's totally fine. Just like let me know and um, unmute or speak up in chat and let me know what the uh, what the issue was. Oh, okay, we got a couple answers in. So yes, we're gonna import um, pipeline. Filter it and then do a plot. Yeah, that looks really good, Catherine. And then Liju had uh, used info to summarize. That's totally fine too as well. And then do the filter and a scatter plot that looks good to me as well. All right. Yeah, those both look good. Um, I'll show you how I did it. it it's, it's very similar. So I made a new data frame called Gapminder 1962. Wow where I, yeah, where I took all, where I subset the Gapminder data set with a logical gate, namely that the year should be equal to 1962. We look ahead for that. Now it's various countries, but every time it's just the year 1962. All right. So after that, we're going to plot them. For that, we're going to need to import um, pyplot as plt, which is its commonly used alias. And then, as I mentioned in the last lecture, you can either use um, pyplot standalone or it interfaces really well with the data frame. So you can just say gapminder1962.plot. And so what are we going to plot? We want to plot CO2 emissions. So that's going to be our x-axis. Actually, no, we want to put, um, well, I actually did the other way around, but it works either way. So we're going to just do the GDP per capita on our x-axis. And our y-axis, we're going to do um, CO2 emissions in metric. Oops. All right. And then the kind, we don't have to specify this. And then plt.show. So that's what that looks like. Doesn't look awesome. I mean, technically, mission accomplished, right? So let's play with this a little bit. So first of all, let's make the labels nicer. All right, much better. My OCD is better. All right, so what can we what can we see here? Well, we see that there's a there's apparently one country that's just like way up there, but most countries are squished around this area between zero and twenty thousand on the x-axis. Henry says data data year to see plot. That's one liner. Yes, I like it. Um, but yeah, much of our data is squished here. So what can we do in this case? When our data spans many ma orders of magnitude, especially on the x-axis, um, and it's, it just gets squished, what we do is we use a logarithmic scale. So let's use log x equals true. And if you just go and Google pi, uh, matplotlib pyplot, um, how to turn uh, uh, an axis to logarithm, you'll find, you'll find this argument. So what's that look like? Well, it looks better. Now on the x-axis, things are much more spread out. But again, we can see that everything seems to be really, really squished on the y-axis as well because of the outliers. So let's turn the y-axis into a logarithmic scale too. Much better. So now on the logarithmic scale, we can see that there seems to be a pretty good correlation between GDP per capita and, and uh, per capita CO2 emissions. 
So this is a this is a figure that we could start to show to someone and actually expect them to, to get some information from, right? Because we can still see that there's one outlier, but we can actually get information about everyone that's here in this uh, in this group here and see that there's definitely a uh, a relationship here, even within this group. All right, next question. Let's calculate the correlation between CO2 emission and GDP per capita. Let's see, let's quantify this relationship right here. So how do people do that? Okay. Yep, that looks really good, Catherine. All right, I'll show you my version. Oh, there's another answer here. Uh, Sci-fi stats also. Yeah, using the same the same Pearson R function, and then a print statement to show them both. Yes, that looks good. All right, I'll show you how I did that. Um, first, I just had a quick look because I had a hunch. For CO2 emissions, we have 195 non null entries. And then for uh, GDP per capita, we only have 128. So there appear to be null values. So what I did was I just dropped them right, real quick. Uh, make a new one. So I just made a new data frame um, where I just dropped dropped all the rows that contained an NA value. Um, but I don't want to do this. I only want to drop rows that contains contain NA values in the two row in the two variables that I'm interested in. So I forget it was if it was um, Catherine or Liju, but one of you guys already filtered your data frame beforehand um, to only include those two data, uh, those two um, metrics. I didn't do that, so I'm going to do it now. So for this, in the drop NA function, you can give it an argument called subset. So this will tell drop NA what columns you're interested in um, filtering based on. So I'll give it a list of columns, and there's going to be two columns. GDP per capita and the CO2 emissions. I'm going to copy this name. This is ridiculous. All right, just copy and paste this. Let's see. All right. And then I import the um, Pearson R function, just like you guys did. Oh, what did I do? There we go. And then I say R and P, which is the two values that this function gives you. It gives you the R correlation and the P value that's associated with that correlation, whether or not we're confident that this correlation is significant. So we assign these two values to, to Pearson R, my data frame. GDP per capita. And the other one is going to be same data frame. Now filtered, uh, filtered data frame. And I want this, uh, this column here. All right. And then I have a print statement just like you guys did. Note that I convert R and P to strings so that I can uh, combine them with my text that I have here. And what we see here, this the R value is 0.92 and a very, very, very low P value. So we are very confident that this the that the correlation between GDP per capita and CO2 emission is real. And in fact, the R is quite high. 
So it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good correlation too. All right. So now we go back to the unfiltered data and answer what year was this uh, was this correlation the strongest? So if you guys want to post your code, you can post your whole code, or you can tell me just the steps that you did. Either way, but it, you can just copy and paste your code if you like. what Catherine did. So you first did a group by year. OK. And then the correlation method, yes. And you specified that the method you want to use for this is Pearson. And then you displayed it. OK, so let's try that. Um, I did something very similar. I called my new thing yearly correlation. You called your Scatminder group. That's totally fine. Um, so that was Scatminder. Uh, I'm just going to say, what, do what you did. Group by year. And then you select from that. Oh, right. Select from that as a new data frame. Uh, well, I, I didn't rename my columns, so I'll use my names. That and GP per capita. And you call the correlation. Yes. So now we have, for each year, we have the sort of correlation matrix right between these two columns. And that is good. Um, that All the information that I asked for is there. But what we can do, and I understand that we didn't really go over this, um, uh, you, can, you can pivot this table a little bit and, uh, and uh, um, kind of change the table layout so that you can sort it and it's easy to see what year it was the highest in. So I'll just show you how to do that. I totally didn't expect you guys to do this like on your own. Um, you could have figured out how probably if you Googled it, but it, it was not obvious at all. So don't worry about it. So what I did is um, I made this same data frame and then I use the unstack method. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Now you can see that the index looks different, right? Before we had as an index the year at one level and then the sort of um, the two, the two variables that we're doing this by as another level. Now, this level of the index has been moved to a column name. So now we can see CO2 emissions per capita versus CO2 emissions per capita is always one, obviously, because they're the same. Same GDP per capita against GDP per capita is always one. And then these two columns are the same because CO2 emissions versus GDP per capita and GDP per capita versus CO2 emissions, that's the same correlation right there. So you can see that instead of having a two-level index and a one-level column name, we now have a one-level index and a two-level column name. So that, that is how you sort of um, shuffle around the indices. Again, this was not something we went over in the lecture, but I'm just showing you how to do this now as sort of a, an add-on to, to the answer. So then the next thing I did is um, I kept only um, only the GDP per capita versus emissions column. So I kept only this column right here because the rest of it is all duplicated or useless information. So what I did here is made a new data frame with just uh, 
copy and paste it so that we don't mess up with just this. So here you can see that I'm giving the index here that I'm giving to this is a thing in parentheses. Now this thing is a tuple. We, over, we only touched on this very briefly, but basically if you have a multi-level column name like here or like here in the index, the way you specify which column is you give it a tuple of CO2 emission, CO2 emission, CO2 emission, GDP, or GDP, CO2 emission. So this pair you pre present it in parentheses and that's what's called a tuple. And that is how I'm presenting it here because I'm saying I want the GDP per capita and CO2 emissions column. So that's this guy right here. All right. Um, then I have to flatten the index. So if we look at this now, that's what it looks like now. So I still have a two level, I still have this annoying two level situation for my column names, which is not exactly what I want, right? Because this isn't actually necessary anymore because I don't have all these combinations anymore. And so what I can do now is what's called flattening this index. So turning it from a multi-level index to just one level because we only have the one column, so it doesn't matter. So what I do for this, I did show you in the lecture how to access the column names. So that's this. So it's just two flat index, right? And if we look at what that looks like now, now it's a flat index. It's got an ugly name and we could change that, but don't worry about it. But it is now only one level. So it's just one uh, column with a bunch of rows and that's kind of what we want. Um, so I'm gonna rename that column real quick. I'll just copy and paste that line of code. So here you see columns, I just gave it a new name. I just say GDP per capita versus CO2 emissions. And then lastly, I sort the values. And I obviously sort it by this column right here. I, I say in place equals true. And I say ascending equals false because I want to sort it descendingly. I want the I want the highest correlation at the top. And then we display this final thing. So we don't need to see this in immediate one anymore. So now it's sorted by this correlation. You can see the hot, the year with the highest correlation was 1967. So again, I. Don't expect, they didn't expect you to like do all this unless you like really got interested and went on a Googling spree. I just wanna show you how you can do sort of from this um, answer where all the information at our quest is there to this answer where it's easily accessible visually, how you can do that with a few extra lines of code and a bit of Googling. Do you guys have any questions? I realize that this has introduced quite a few concepts from stacking and pivoting to index flattening and all this sort of stuff that we didn't talk about at all. So don't worry about that. Like I, I learned this by just Googling a ton. Uh, so I, I really didn't expect you to just do this, but uh, now that I've shown you, do you guys have any questions about how this worked or what exactly I did? Or flat act, two flat index. Yeah. So, oh, where did I go? There we are. Okay. So, if I show you, oops. If I display things here, and I display things here. So 
this is what we start with, right? Yeah. So here I've just selected a column, right? From here to here, that's not that much magic. Well, it's the unstacking, but then I just selected a column. So now what we have here is a two-level index, just like here um, where we have a two-level row index. Here we have a two-level column index because we, we pivoted it, right? So what we do from here to here, this is the two-flat index step right here. So you see how we go from two levels to one level. So that's what two-flat index does. It takes all these like hierarchical combinations of column names and just sort of turns them into one level of column name. Does that make any sense? Oh, Ooh, Henry with a for loop. Stop the presses. Yes, correct, Mark. It's just for it's just for column names. Um, yes, it just turns the hierarchical column names into a single, a flat, single flat hierarchy, where all the com where all the hierarchies, hier combinations of levels are now just combinations that are side by side. Cool. All right. So this this one was a challenge. This one I had you just uh, go look in the wild for a new package that I suggested and ask you to see if you can figure it out. So what did anyone? Did anyone figure this out? You can say, like, if you didn't, type no, just so I know that. Like, um, if you did, type yes. If you didn't, type no, just so I kind of know where we're at with this one. Oh, hi. Someone did. There is code. You use Faultly Express. OK, that works. And Catherine also did. OK, cool. All right, cool. So we got a couple of things here. Let's have a look. Uh, all right. OK. Oh, that looks like it might work. I haven't run it exactly, so I can't tell you if there's like a slight error there. But okay, so. OK, yeah, so someone just pointed something out to me. Um, that's actually a good question to ask. So before we just do the, the graphing real quick, um, now that we have this ordered sort of table of um, years and correlations, uh, can you guys see any sort of trend here, or any sort of interpretation, and what that might mean for, uh, for what's going on in the world? That's actually a good question. Whenever you, whenever you create some new piece of data, have a look at it and think about what might this mean. If anyone has a thought, what happened in 1977? What did happen in 1977? Oh, yeah. Well, so first, there appears to be sort of an overall trend that as we get later, like 76 and 72 were flipped, but still like, oh, hi. What did I just do? Let's go back here. As we go later in the years, the correlation seems to get less strong. So what's that mean? What do you guys think that means? Any thoughts?
All right, well, so if I were to look at this, so yeah, there's a couple of things to jump out at me, right? So one is this sort of seeming relationship that as time goes on, the correlation goes down. So that would indicate maybe there's some sort of mechanism of play where as we get more recent in time, the amount of money your country has per capita doesn't dictate as clearly how much they pollute. So what could this mean? Well, this could might, for example, mean that cars, which are one of the main modes that individuals pollute, have gotten more affordable for the general population. So maybe it's not, maybe just more people have cars. And so the, the um, relationship between wealth and pollution doesn't matter that, isn't that close anymore. Or maybe there's something else, but, but it would indicate that there's some sort of mechanism at play where some sort of technology or something has become more available over time that has kind of muddied the waters a little bit. And then, yeah, there seems to be an outlier here, 1977. Well, whenever you have an outlier, especially with historical data like this, it's a good question to ask, well, what happened in 1977? Is there some sort of conflict? Was there some sort of global catastrophic events? What, what is the reason why in 1977 the, um, the correlation is so much lower. Does anybody have a guess what might have happened in 1977? Increase in service industry decrease. Yeah, sure. Wealthier countries over time have stopped using manufacturing as much. Um, so their industrial output of CO2 has gone down. So that concentrates it. Um, Meanwhile, lower lower income countries have gotten access to more polluting technologies. I think 1977 could have been the oil crisis where wealthy countries didn't drive as much and didn't use as much. Yeah, that's right. 1976, seven was the, uh, the oil crisis. So a lot of wealthy countries stopped using, well, didn't stop using, but tried to use as much less oil. So that would muddy the waters. All right. So back to uh, back to Plotly. So there were a couple of answers here, and they both looked like they would work. So I'm just going to. I think I might just copy one of them and see what happens. Oh, All right. Now, obviously, I have some different names here, right? So mine's called Gapminder. I haven't made it yet. And then I also did drop in A. So this is what I did for my filter data. Set. And so then here, um, I'll just change the name of the column that you had, Catherine. So let's see what happens if we do that. Very nice. So that works. You have the logarithmic axis on the X and also the Y. Cool. They do seem to be color coded by continent. And the uh, population size dictates the bubble size. Now you could play with this and make it a little prettier here or a little different there or whatever, but this this works. Good job. I have nothing to add. All right. So what is next? What is the relationship between continent and energy use in 2007 with a stats test? All right. Let's see you guys' code.
or if you had trouble with this one and didn't manage to do it, type, uh, put that in chat too, so I can um, go ahead and do it and show you guys. Only came up with his rim. Okay, that's fine. How about lead you? Did you get did you get something? We'll just go ahead and have a look then. So first, let's uh, look at the year 2007, right? All right, so we'll do that. Uh, I think that was fine. Yeah. Okay, and the next... Um, we will do the, um, we'll group it. So, oops, because we want to group things by continent. And then next, we want the means and the errors. So we want the energy use. I'll just copy that real quick. The mean. And the errors. Let's have a look at those. That kind of group is not defined. Oh, I'm an idiot. That is not the name I gave this. So we have some uh, some means here and some errors here. That's something we can work with in 2007. So now, let's plot these. So we'll do means. So we want to plot the means, right? And so we'll say kind equals bar. Let's try to build this from the ground up. OK. Well, that's what the means look like. Next, we did have this errors thing. So if you do a bit of Googling, you can see that the um, argument for providing an errors is just y error. And we'll pass it this thing. Now, standard deviation is pretty high. You can turn this into SEM by just, do you want to see how? By just counting. And calling this new variable m. And dividing the standard deviation by the square root of m. Maybe I'm doing that wrong, but I think that is correct. Uh, 
function p is not up, I never actually encoded numpy. Oh, look at those errors. So much nicer looking. Standard error of the mean instead of standard deviation. All right. So this is a bar plot where we look at each continent's uh, mean and with errors, averages. So that's the first, first part of the question. Now we need a stats test. So let's have a look at that. Um, what stat test do we use when we compare multiple means by that apply to one variable? Yes, one way ANOVA. This is correct. So SciPy allows us to do this. And let's have a look at how that works. We don't need to Pearson right now the f underscore one-way function from scipy.stats lets us do that. So um, we will just do f and p is the two values that the f one-way function gives us. Um, and that is the f statistic and the associated p value. And we'll do this for Gapminder that 2007 and we'll have to do it for each continent separately I think we might actually have to because this is already grouped so I'm not quite sure if that's going to work because I did it a slightly different way so let's just give that a try Otherwise, I'll just, you know what? I'm just going to undo the grouping here real quick, because that way we're not going to run into trouble. Um, so here we want the continent to be equal to Africa. And then I'm just going to do a bunch of copy pasting because there are one, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five. And to make it a little bit more readable, I'm do this. And then the second one is Americas. Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Oh. There we go. And then we're just going to print the F statistic. Just like we did before with the, uh, what was it, the correlation? Let's see if I messed up. Oh, I so did. Could not convert string to float, Algeria. What did I do? All right, let's troubleshoot. Henry, if you already see it, you can let me know and gloat. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm gonna try and figure out what I did wrong. So apparently there was a problem with converting something to a, to a string, a string to a float, which is odd. So what do we do here? Aha. Uh -huh. So this is the entire data frame where the continent is Africa. We just want the one column. So what do we do here? Uh, we use, I used loc. So now, Pretty sure we're getting there. So now we supply a um, a row and a column. So the row is all the rows where the continent is Africa, and the column 
is only the energy use. So if anyone's wondering what the error was, this here is in the entire data frame where the, column, where the continent is the Americas, so all the variables in that data frame. And it's telling me, well, this is weird. Some of these values are like not numbers, and I don't know how to do F and OVAs on text because I only wanted to supply that one column, the energy use. Let's see if that works. So we're going to add that everywhere. Let's see if that fixes our problem. And then it'll be dot load everywhere. We did go over the loc in the lecture, so that's good. Closing parentheses did not match open parentheses. Okay. What is the issue here? Ah. My copy pasting was not up to snuff. NAM. So close and yet so far. All right. Because I, so the reason why I'm trying to figure this out on the fly right now is because I, for myself, did it for all the years. And so there was like a weird for loop situation going on. And um, so I'm trying to like make this easier right now. But all I'm doing is making it harder for myself. Henry, thoughts? Oh, yeah. Uh I was going to say maybe, uh, so there's a way to do this where you don't have to define these continents separately, right? Um, that, might, that might be a little bit easier. Um, I think it's really easy when, when you hard code something like this to, to make a mistake. Um, so I would, I would kind of try to do it without hard coding. So, um, let me see if I can actually write that in the chat here. Okay, yeah, sure. but but yeah, go go ahead, keep going. I'll 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 do this in the chat in a second. Right. We'll come back to this in just a second. Sorry about that. That's what happens when I do it a more complicated way and then try to try to go back. All right. All right. So this one, I did the same way as I asked you guys to. So that is going to be a lot better. So okay, did you guys figure out? Um, how to do question number seven. If so, post in chat, or if not, tell me what the, um, where you got stuck. Yep, there's code. All right. Uh, import two test independent, okay. And then you dropped everything where you didn't know anything about imports, that is good too. Filter by year. Look at only Asia and Europe, and then did a t-test. Yes, that looks like it will work. And then Liju also filtered for the year, and then by column number. Okay, well, it'll work. You'll just have to keep track of what number column you're interested in. Um, okay. And then you do the bar plot. And also a t-test. OK. So I'll show you how I did it. So I did it with, ah, I see what you did, Catherine. You looked at Asia and Europe. OK, so one thing um, that's not quite right, Kathleen, for yours is that you compared the Asia and Europe um, columns, or sort of the, the Asia and Europe group for all the years after 1990, which I guess Given the way I phrased that question, that's actually totally fine. What I had in mind was at each year after 1990, was there a, dif was there a statistical difference? But I'm rereading the way I wrote my question right now, and I can totally see how you understood it the way you did. So that's fine. You, that was not a mistake on your part. That was not 
good phrasing on my part. Um, So I'll show you how I did it for um, for each year after after that. Um, so I will just copy and paste my solution real quick, and then go line by line over what exactly it does. So I did sort of the same hard coding I did before that Henry is trying to help me out of right now. Um, so I did for each year in 1992, 97, 2002, and, nine, and 2007. I looked at the Gapminder data set where the continent is Asia and the year is whatever year I'm in right now, right? And then I created another thing called Europe that is Gapminder, that is the part of the Gapminder data set where the continent is Europe and also the year is the year I'm currently looking at. I only look at the imports column and I drop values that are MA. And then I do the T test just like you did, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe Swiss German will work better next time for the phrasing. That's true. Um, and then I have a a print statement for the um, T and P values. Let's see what that looks like. T test. Oh yeah, I didn't import. Um, let's import this real quick. From. There you go. That'll be better. All right, so in 1992, the, let's just look at the p-values, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, never was it significant. Um, out of uh, curiosity, Catherine, was it significant for you when you looked at all the years grouped together? I actually didn't do it that way. Nope, okay, cool. Um, all right, so that's how you did that. That's how that worked. Did you guys, uh, does anybody have a question about, about how this worked? P-value for the 0.16, okay, yeah. Does anybody have a question about, uh, about this answer, how it worked? Otherwise, thanks for the, oh yeah, no problem, no problem. No, it was totally my fault, like this, I never thought of that my own question that other way, but like I could see how that would totally be able to be read that way. Don't worry about it. All right, if there's no question, let's move on to finding the most densely populated country. So what is the country that has the highest population density across all years? So here I told you to first create a new column ranking a new column that ranks each country's density within a year, then calculate the average rank, and then look at who has the highest. So if you guys want to post what you have for that. Or just let me know what the uh, where you got stuck if you didn't manage to go to do the whole question. All right, I'll just, um, in the interest of time, I'll post my solution and then we'll go through it for this one. All right, so here is my solution. I create a, um, a, a clean Gapminder data frame where I drop all the rows that are MA into population density. So all the rows where we don't know anything about population densities, I drop those. 
Then, as told you, as I told you in the hint, I create a new column, the pop underscore rank, where I first group by year, and then I look at the population density, and then a quick Google will tell me that there's actually a rank method for the pandas data frame, where I can just tell it to, within groups, rank everything. So if I actually, um, yeah, if I split this real quick, and I just display this. What we see here is that we now have a pop rank, where for each year, let's see, the first uh, five rows are Afghanistan across the across the years. It's always hovering around uh, one one hundred seventieth place. Except here, it actually uh, went down quite a few places. The population density in Afghanistan must have gone down. Nineteen eighty two, that was I think the Soviet invasion. So that's sad. Um, so now we have this new column for, wherein for each year we have the country ranked. So next, I create an average rank for each country and then display the top ranked countries. So what I do here is I create this um, thing called pop rank F where I take, where I group my, uh, my new clean um, Gapminder data frame, this time by country name. I take the population rank, and then I sum it and divide it by the count. I actually should have just written mean, but it's fine. Summing and dividing by the count is the same as mean. Then um, I rename this thing, this series, I rename it to average population density rank, and I display it, I display its head. So what does that look like? Yeah. That's what this looks like, the first five entries in this thing. The, um, the Republic of Macau in China was average of rank 1.5 for densest, and it is tied with Monaco for the densely, most densely populated country in the world over the years. Any questions about that before we do the very last one that involves some pivoting? Yeah, the crux of the last one is pivoting. I'll give you guys a chance to ask questions if you have them. Did you want to see the um the solution for the other one? Sure. Post it. OK. Um, so anyone else who has a question about what we just did, just post it in chat, too, and we'll get to it in a second. OK. Um, so the first thing that you could do is what I just put in the in the chat there. Um, would it be OK? It might be easier if I share my screen on this, actually. Okay. You want to do this after I do this last question real quick? That sounds good. Yeah. Just for the for the sake of time. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, I don't think anyone posted the question. So I'll just, again, post my solution for the last question and we'll go over it line by line. And then that'll be that. And we can go to the Q&A. All right. So first thing I do is I do the pivot method, which pivots um, a variable um, from a column into the index. And then, so you, you, just, you supply it with two variables that are currently columns in your data frame. And you say, I want this variable to be the index of the new table, and so the row names, and this column to be the column names. So it'll go country names from top to on the left, from top to bottom, and then it'll go years left to right across the top. And what do I want to fill this with? I want to fill it with life expectancy at birth, so with the, the value we're interested in, right? So if I do this, split these again real quick, um, and then I drop all the NAs, and we display its head. So what we see here is now we filled this 
with countries going going down the, the rows and years going across the columns. And all the values here are the life expectancy at birth for that year and column combination. Does that make sense? Does this idea of pivoting a table, does that have you guys heard about this before? If anyone has like no idea what I just did here, let me know now and I'll explain it. Otherwise, yeah, just post that in chat. I'll, I'll, I'll go over the second half of the answer right now. And then actually it will be Q&A time anyway after Henry does his thing. So I'll be happy to talk about Pivot. So if you have questions about it, just uh, tell me now. So now that we have this handy table, um, what do we do? Well, I just added a column that is the increase in life expectancy between 1962 and 2007. And I just, and that is just the difference, literally life expectancy in 2007 minus life expectancy in 1962. And then I display this thing sorted by this new increase column. So here we go. We have the same values here on the left except now I've created this new increase column and I'm sorting the data by this. So here we see that the Maldives have increased their life expectancy from 1962 to 2007 by almost 40 years or almost yeah, 37 years, um, which is impressive. And they're leading the world in that particular improvement. So are there any immediate questions about this last question here before I hand it over to um, Henry for the um, with that ANOVA and we uh, we open it the floor to general questions. Doesn't look like it. All right, uh, Henry, you can go ahead and share your screen and then we'll do this last last little bit. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, oh, let me see if I think I got the right one here. Okay. So, uh, just ignore all this for right now. Uh, just know that what you could do with this data is basically, you know, so we're subsetting to the year 2007. So, okay, sorry, just to remind everyone, we're on question six, what is the relationship between continent and energy use kilogram of oil equivalent per capita in 2007 says so stats test needed. Uh, ignore everything up here. Basically what you can do, oh, sorry. Um, oh, anyways, okay. So basically what you can do is you can get everything from the year 2007. You can get the columns continent and energy use kilogram of oil, drop the NAs and then group it by continent. This, this should all feel fairly familiar at this point. And when you look at that data two object you just made, what does it say? Well, it says it's a group by generic data frame group by type object. So that might seem a little bit confusing, but one of the things you can do with these group by objects is you can treat them like an iterable. So you can use a for loop with them. So we say for call name call in data two, print call.head. And you can see when you do that, you actually get five separate data frames with the data for. Um, for energy use and continent split up by continent based on the grouping variable. So when we group it by continent, it now becomes an iterable that we can actually unlock using a for loop. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. So we've now got our five data frames. Uh, what you can do is instead of doing it like this, you can do a list comprehension, which is what you see here. So we say for call name, call in call, or sorry, in data two, and we're gonna just grab that one column, which is the energy use column. And so we can see this here. So this is the exact same thing I was just showing, except it's just with the energy use column now. And it's now in a list. So list comprehension. And then this is a special kind of operator that you see in a lot of functions where basically you say, um, you know, rather than supplying it like this, right? Because the other way would have been vals uh you know per group one or sorry <laughs> i'm thinking about r right now valus per group one or uh, valus per group you know second element you know and so on and so forth supplying it with those commas instead you can just do like this which is i think they call this an expansion anyways so that's how you would get that and yeah 
I just figured out the problem with mine. I can show mine real quick too. Go for it. So this is what we had. Um, so this is just a plotting bit. So let's not worry about that right now. I filtered by year and then said, um, for each continent, take the energy use column and do the ANOVA. And it gave me this NA, right? Well, that's because there are NAs in these columns. And um, the ANOVA will yell at you if some of your cells are NAs. So all you got to do is drop NA, subset the energy use column. Boom. Statistically significant p-value for one-way ANOVA for energy use across continents. That was all I was missing here. So whenever your ANOVA gives you an NA, think about do you have NAs in your data? Always think about do you have NAs in your data, as um, Dan will tell you a lot about in the future. You should always know if there are NAs in your data, where they are, and what you plan to do with them. In my case, I just kicked them out of the data set. All right. Are there any questions about this? At this point, Henry and Dan and I are happy to answer any questions you have about what's coming down the line, about anything we've done in the past four weeks, any questions you have, any concept you're struggling with in the basics of Python. We really just want to make sure that we're all on the same page before we hand you guys over to Daniel for the uh, for the last portion, or the well, the last portion, the majority of the workshop, which is the machine learning portion. You're welcome, Alzra. Yeah, we're, we're over time. So if, if you don't want to ask any questions um, and you don't want to hear any questions, feel free to, to head out. Um, and we'll see you for part two. Yeah, sorry sorry about this. The, the homework took a little longer than I thought it would. But yeah, if anyone has any questions that they want answered. So Catherine, stay. Catherine asked here, are you going to post the completed homework on GitHub? I, I'm very conflicted on the idea of doing that um, because I think that that incentivizes people to to be lazy because I know if the homework is available to me, I'll be lazy, but um, maybe we'll put it in a separate folder or something like that so that um, so that you're not as easily tempted to look at it. Yeah, I mean, now that the, this portion of the class is over, I think it would be solutions equals NA. Well, seems like there's probably not any questions then. You know, you can always email us anytime though. Um, come to office hours, anything like that. We are we are very happy to meet with you or respond over email and answer any questions that arise. Okay. Well, um, I don't know, Simon, is that you think we're we're good for today then? I think so. I think this just means we did such a wonderful job that uh, everything is perfectly clear. Yeah. <laughs> and if you if you've got any uh, if you've got any um, lingering doubts or concerns or if you feel totally lost, uh, do feel free to reach out and also do feel free to go back to data camp and keep practicing. They've got really excellent practice materials there. Yeah, uh, definitely. You, data camp is where it's at. Also, we have office hours. Uh, feel free to schedule an office hour visit. If you want to talk about something one-on-one, -on -one, you just feel really lost on a certain topic, uh, we're, we're happy to, to talk you through it. Um, one other thing, which is that um, go ahead and get started with the uh, Intro to Scikit-Learn. I'm also going to send this in an email later tonight, but uh, go ahead and get started in the Intro to Scikit-Learn course on Data Camp. That's going to be due um, on Module 6. 
So um, you've got a, a couple weeks to do that one. Um, and that'll be a really excellent introduction to a lot of the concepts that Dan is going to be talking through, such as um, exploratory data analysis and simple supervised machine learning models. Okay. Well, it's really been, it's been a pleasure working with you all. Um, we're going to hand it over to Dan starting next week, but uh, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you all have learned so quickly and um, I'm, yeah, just very excited to get started with the, uh, with part two. Actually learn some machine learning. Yeah, I can't wait. You guys really set it up well. Thank you. All right. Well then, uh, thank you all everyone and we will see you all next time. Okay.